not very common in silversmithing, or usually they, they help their husbands. For me, I do all this by myself, so nobody helps me. Um, my grandmother was a silversmith, and I think I'm pretty much the only one in my whole family, extended family, uh, silversmith, female silversmith. Now, Tanya uses a lot of uh, the material that she uses is sterling silver and a variety of bright colored stones, natural stones. And so, uh, would you tell us where you get your materials from? Uh, yes, I, I love to work with different color stones. Um, my work is more modern, kind of a little bit mixed with, um, it's contemporary mixed with a little bit of touch of uh, traditional work. And I get my supplies mostly in Gallup, New Mexico, which is the Indian jewelry capital of the world, or as they say. But I get all my supplies there. My stones come from different parts of the world. I use a lot of natural, different, uh, natural stones from all over the world, as far as um, uh, such as corals, spiny oyster shells, different parts, types of turquoise, lapis, uh, sujolites, charite, pearls, mother of pearl, rhodonite, quartz, just different colors, different stones, yeah. Now what you see is the end result of what Tanya does in, in, in cre her creations here. So I, I'd like you to um, talk about the process of how you develop, uh, a, say, a ring or a bracelet. Yes, I, I love to, like I said again, I love to work with different um, pieces. And lo a lot of my pieces are one of a kind piece, like the one I'm wearing here. Um, I, make, I do a lot of uh, adjustable size rings. Uh, pendants, bracelets, necklaces. Um, I also made purses, sterling silver purses. And I start off with bezeling a piece. Um, and first I get, start off with uh, laying out the stonework, how the pieces are gonna look. And then I solder the pieces together on a plate with all the little designs, swirly designs. Then I cut out the piece. After the pieces are cut out, then I take it to the buffing room and buff them, polish them, and then after that the stones get set. So then that's the final piece that you see there. Um, and here at, the, at my table today, I will be setting stones because I didn't finish. As usual, I'd be, I, I don't know why, I just never finish with my work at the end. And a lot of the other colleagues are, they watch me. They, I mean, not that I tend to demonstrate, it's not that, it's just because I didn't finish. So, so you're more than welcome to watch me set stones at my table. <laughs> Yeah. She's also been known, um, and we were joking about this earlier, as the queen of the cluster. So you want to explain that yeah, a little bit? Yeah, somebody, because I'm always, I work with so many different stones. I work with clusters, so peop, I, I got labeled as queen of clusters or bezel queen. Um, so that's kind of like what people, uh, I've been kind of nicknamed for. Now here's one of uh, Tanya's purses that she was talking about earlier about what she created. So you want to talk, yes. tell us what started um, you? Yeah, um, what really started was a close friend of mine sent me a birthday card one year and I had just bought silver and I was sitting there thinking, meditating at the same time and the birthday card is about five by seven size and I had it bent and I was thinking, what am I going to do with the silver I had just bought? And when I kind of got back to reality, I opened my eyes and I noticed a birthday card was in a U-shape bent. And I'm thinking, I literally saw the shape of this purse, like a U-shape, literally saw like stones. So from there, it just kind of, my imagination went from that to a real sterling silver purse. And I've made 57 different bags, different shapes, different stones. Um, I just made one about three weeks ago. So unfortunately, I won't, I don't have one here to show, but they do take a lot of time to make. And this particular one has over 350 stones. So, and they're all different, uh, different colors, different shapes, different stones. And they do come with a detachable chain strap. Yeah, so. Now, several years ago, um, I was at the Santa Fe Indian Art Market uh, with Tanya, and she um, had on display a, uh, sterling silver chess set. And I wanted to explain uh, what, uh, what how this came about, the chess set. Um, yeah, my son, when he was seven years old, he used to always, <clears throat> he used to play the chess tournaments in school. And he would tell me, mom, you need to do something in silver, that would be cool. And so that kind of 
you know, got me motivated to make the sterling silver chess set. So it's about 20 by 20. Um, each piece is, one was stamped, one was not. So they were checkered like that. So one was plain, one was stamped, plain stamped. And then my pieces were about four inches tall and they had a theme, Navajo from the 50s era. So it would be a Navajo family versus the trading post people. So the trading post people are white people, you know, because so back in the 50s on my reservation, so a lot of the Navajo family would take their work into the, to the market to sell their pieces so they could buy groceries or clothing or whatever supplies. And um, so that's kind of the strategy between the two. So it was a Navajo family versus the trading post people. So it was the queen and the king were the Navajo man and Navajo lady. And on the trading post side was the trading post owner and his wife. And then of course the bishop was two ch a church. Over here was two yei gods, the, the deity. Um, and then let me see, there was the, the knight, the horse, where the, the a wagon and over here was a pickup truck with gas pump. And then the pawns were uh, bracelets for the Navajo side, little tiny cluster bracelets. And then on the, on the trading post side were also bracelets, but they had attached uh, a dead pawn ticket attached to it. So it was pawn, pawn, dead pawn. So it was all sterling silver. It did take um, almost close to a year to finish. And I did place first place at it. So it was pretty exciting. Yeah, she placed, uh, she took a first place in her category with that piece and sold it at that market right. as well. Yes, I did. And I've been trying to talk her into making another one. And here are some of the, her pieces that you uh, will, uh, you can see uh, all the work that she has done. Um, I, I told her, I said, I wish I would have put um, one image in here. And it was an image of her where she also was buffing um, the jewelry and the image of her is she's all in black. <laughs> My black. face was black. Yeah, um, I had uh, did a selfie of myself after I buffed. So my face was literally black. My hands were black. My hands are still black. They're stained. So, um, but yeah, and I posted it and um, a lot of my male silversmith colleagues kind of got after me and they were saying, you're supposed to wear a mask, wear goggles. Why, you know, don't be you know, you shouldn't be like that. It's got a lot of chemicals involved, which is true. Yes, it's very true. But I do have a glass shield over my buffing machine, and then I have two little holes. I put my hand through there, and I buff. So I feel like I'm protected somehow. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yes, it's true. I do need to wear a mask and goggles for safety. Okay, now we're going to turn to uh, Peter Boom here. And I want to ask him, um, what started him uh, and influenced him in, um, in the carvings that you will see here and also to explain a little bit behind uh, what the audience is seeing. All right, so um, I grew up in the Northwest and there's carving all over the place. It's, it's all around us, so everybody carves. If you're, if you're a guy or a girl or you're interested in art at all, you carve. That's just kind of the way it works. Um, so on this photo here, you see the boxes. Those are bentwood boxes. And then um, the other piece is a rattle piece that I did last year. But the bentwood boxes, I don't have any, I wasn't able to bring any this year. Um, I just don't have any finished. I'm like June where usually I'm working behind my booth. But a bentwood box, the sides are all one piece of wood. It's a flat panel and I, we carve a kerf or a, a seam in the side and then we steam it and bend it. And so there's only one seam in that box and it's on one corner. And then we peg it or, or sew the corner and I also pegged the bottom. So those boxes are made with no glue at all. So a really old style of, of carving, a really old style of uh, woodworking. And those are all made out of red cedar. I also like to ask Peter about some of the materials that you use. And, um, and this is a, a, a mask. And if you'll explain uh, what you're seeing here. So this mask, um, carved this mask out of alder, I believe. This was Slapu, it's a basket woman. Um, story of, and I used horse hair, and then um, I actually did a twist on this mask. This mask went to the Autry Museum in LA, and most of these Slapu masks are usually black because it's a, it's a really scary story. It's about keeping kids in line. We have an a, a old lady that lives in the woods. She's kind of like a big ogre, and she walks around and she'll whistle at night, 
and so, so her lips are all puckered up. And we call her the basket woman because she has, carries around a big basket. And if kids are running around, she'll take them and throw them in a the basket and take them home and eat them. Um, but usually it's black. Usually the, the mask is black. And I thought it would be much scarier and white for a variety of reasons. And so I did a few years ago in white. And I've just continued to do them, different versions of them. So that's what this mask is. But I like to use uh, red cedar and alder for masks. Um, alder because it's really, really durable, it's hard, and it's available, and when it's fresh, it's really, really fun to carve. When it's dry, it's no fun to carve at all. And cedar I like just because it's a f easy wood to carve, if it's, it smells good, it, it's just a nice wood, and it's really light. Now, I was telling Peter, uh, I want to show you this next image. Um, uh, I told Peter that I'm, I do beadwork, and one time I was making a pair of moxins, and to make a pair of moxins, uh, to put the rawhide soles on, uh, you have to use a metal awl to stick through the rawhide. And I had put it on my leg to drive a, a hole through the rawhide, and the rawhide uh, slipped, and the metal awl went right into my, my leg. And so when I saw this image of Peter, uh, I immediately thought of that. <laughs> See, he, he goes around social media and finds all of our bad uh, habits. <laughs> and, and so the, the, the all that he was using went through both, both layers of rawhide, apparently. Um, so this is a texture ads. And I, with the texture ads, you're just tapping, tap, 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 tap. But uh, for, for other people, there's a, a bunch of different style of ads. But I was just texturing the face of this mask and this actually might be the same mask that you just saw. It, it was just kind of getting some texture in there. Um, no, kids, don't try this at home. You're going to cut yourself, especially with the texture ads. Usually I have a leather, uh, like an apron thing that I'll throw down for when you inevitably slip. Um, this time I was just some heavy cargo shorts that are pretty torn up. And yeah, don't do this at home. It's, it's not a good <laughs> idea. Now, Peter, um, could you explain to us how you, you move? I mean, you still do carving, but you also moved into the hand-pulled um, uh, serographs. So. So, so this is a new piece. So um, that material that I'm working with is that red material. It's called ruby lith. It's a photosensitive film. And I'm not holding a pen. I'm actually holding an X-Acto knife. And so for me, moving from carving to printmaking was pretty easy because it's just drawing with a knife a lot of times. So I'll cut out a stencil for every single color and I transfer the color to a screen and then I print one color at a time in a layering process. And so the image that you see on the right, I guess it's probably the same on your right, um, that image is one of my newer pieces. It's uh, our origin story. And I believe I've got 10 or 12 different screens on that piece, so about 10 or 12 different colors. So I had to cut out a stencil for each one of those colors. And that origin story is our people, we came from the heavens and we came one of two different ways. The first was lightning, which is we see in the center, and then on the sides we have falling stars. So we came to, from the heavens and we brought light to the world. And so this is the origin of our people. That's what that story is about. Okay, thank you. Now, um, Peter is also an um, owner artist of Aroquin. Is that his name? Aroquin, yeah. Aroquin uh, Designs, a design company uh, creating original artwork as well as commissioned art such as logos, brochures, and t shirts. Now, he's not only an impressive artist, but he's an adjunct professor at Evergreen State College and Northwest Indian College in. Olympia, Washington, where he received both a Bachelor's of Art and Master's of Environmental Studies. And he also holds a jur juris? Juris. Juris. doctorate from the uh, University of Washington School of Law in Seattle, Washington. So I thought that was quite impressive. <laughs> yeah, I'm one of those overly educated idiots. <laughs> <laughs> I can't do anything right, but. Yeah, so um, the pieces on here, I think if you want to, the one on the very bottom corner, that's a uh, circular moon mask. I did that this summer. That's carved out of yellow cedar, Alaskan yellow cedar with abalone inlay. 
and I cut the abalone because you can't find it the size you want it to have. And then the other one that I didn't talk about up in the upper corner, that's actually a rattle, that wolf one uh, with a dancer. It's a wolf dancer rattle, and the arms were articulated so they could move. And the, the head actually, you can come out of the body, and there's a handle that's hidden by the button blanket. And that one first, first in Santa Fe last year, um, first in its division, and it's holding a little rattle that's a miniature rattle, less than, probably smaller than my thumb, and that actually would have a sound in it as well. But I did bring a rattle similar to that. I have a raven dancer rattle. And as far as I know, I'm the only one that makes those rattles because they're a lot of work, and I don't think anybody else is that crazy. So uh, come on downstairs and check out the one I have, and you can ask me a bunch of questions about it then. Okay, we're going to open it up for questions from, uh, from our audience. And we have a, a, a mic over here. So anybody have any questions for our artists? I'm just going to have to keep talking. I know. I, please ask a question. <laughs> <laughs> oh, here we go. I'll take this question. Thank you so much for your talk. Um, and my question is more as an artist wanting to know what work has given you the most satisfaction? What piece have you made that gave you great satisfaction? What was the oh, when it's finished. I think all pieces. <laughs> and you know what? When it, there's no goof ups. You know, I keep all my, my, my goof up jewelry. Like say if a stone's cracked and it's finished, I'm like, oh well, I'll just keep it. They're my keepers. And then, then people end up buying it or taking it or I give them away. But yeah, all of them. <laughs> There's not one piece, but I think all of them. Uh, my answer is going to be similar to hers. My, my favorite piece is my next piece, um, generally, or when it's finished and I'm done. Or, I think that it never comes out of your mind in a finished product exactly how you thought. I don't think that's ever happened. And I think that I see real satisfaction for me is when I see somebody with it or I see a piece later on down the road, or if I see a mask, so, so if I go to a potlatch or something and I see one of my masks that I completely forgot about when I see somebody dance it, that's, that's pretty cool. I'm like, oh yeah, ooh, I could do so much better now, but that's cool. Yeah, that's kind of the <laughs> thoughts that go through in my head. I think we have another question, another question over here. Peter, I actually have two questions. The first was, what was your early inspiration to become an artist? And yeah. then I see you work in multiple media. What has been the drive that makes you go from one media to the next? Okay. Our um, early inspiration, I think that as a Salish artist, there wasn't a lot of Coast Salish work. It wasn't until the late 70s, early 80s that Salish work started to make a, a comeback. And I'm of the second generation of new Salish artists who have really pushed the work. So I'm inspired by old work, by museum pieces, by historic pieces. And I think I'm inspired by just artists in general. And I don't remember not doing work, if that makes sense. I probably, I was drawing on the wall when I was a kid and I'm, I'm still, I never stopped, realistically. And um, what pushes me to do other work is I'm, I'm just really interested in a wide range of stuff. I also work in glass. I've done leather work and feather work. And um, I'm just always interested in being uncomfortable as an artist. I think that once you get into a comfort zone, you kind of get stagnant. And so I like to work in as many mediums as I can and try different things because I have different ideas about the world. And one of the things as an artist, I always try to narrate whatever it is that's going on, whether it's my own personal story or historic stories or what it be. I like to think of art as a narration or an illustration of, of life. And so there are a lot of stories left that need to be told f for, for me that I need to tell artistically that may not, and I just try to find the best medium to tell those stories. Sometimes it's carving, sometimes it's painting, sometimes it's printing. I have ideas, like I have this idea of something I want to do in glass, I just have to get the opportunity to go back to the glass studio and do a couple glass pieces, and yeah, I've got ideas. So it's just like, oh, how could I tell this? Oh, hmm, let's try this, let's try that. And then I fail a lot, so it's okay. I'm coming. Oh, there's gonna be one behind you. 
and then we'll come to you. <laughs> My question is for Tanya. Um, do you see, do you pay much attention to mainstream fashion and jewelry world? And if so, how does that intersect or interact with your work? Uh, yes, I, I'm really influenced and inspired by a lot of uh, fashion in today all over. I do look at, I do see other um, fashion from all over, like uh, magazines, um, even in clothing, not necessarily in jewelry, um, even in makeup and, and just like here, being here in New York, I'm like, wow, I was with my friend James and we're just people watching. I'm seeing all different kinds of the beauty in different people. To me, that's, that's an art form, the way how they're dressed and the kind of uh, jewelry. I, I mean, if that's the question um, you want me to answer, but I, I don't know if that's your, but it, yeah, that's kind of what I, how I see that. Thank you. One in, one in the front we row. have one up here. This is for both of you, really. Um, I live in um, Providence, Rhode Island, right in the center of the Rhode Island School of Design, which is loaded <laughs> with artists. And I've lived there for quite a while and begun to all the exhibits, and I actually have um, people who are, live in my house who are still artists and can... Um, creating all the time. One of the things I've noticed is that there's a tier of people who are artists and who just make whatever they need to make to sell and it's, it's big business. But then there's another tier who really have trouble letting go of some pieces. And I wondered if you ever got so attached to something you were working on that you just didn't want to let it go. Yes, I do. Um I, there's a lot of certain pieces I get sentimentally attached to them. I think it starts with the, the stones. Certain stones speak to me, and I'm like, oh, my God, this is, this is what I got to keep. And, and when somebody says, I'll take that, I literally have to, like, uh, I really have to like this person for them to give it, you know, to sell it to. <laughs> you know, not, not, I mean, in that sense, but, yeah, I do see it get sentimentally attached to some pieces. And I did keep... I had to force myself to keep some pieces. So, and like, don't, don't sell it. This is yours. Keep it. Don't, you know, let it, yeah, so. I, I'm going to answer that question a little bit differently. I do have a couple of pieces I've kept, but not, not many. Generally, when I want to keep a piece, then I know it's good. And I'll do one of two things. I'll either raise the price or, <laughs> or what I generally do if it's a carving is I'll give it away. Uh, I'll give it to family and friends so that it'll be used. Uh, make sure that it's it's used ceremonially or it's used, and then I will see that piece. And um, the reason being is that once it's used, once it's danced, it's alive. And so, if I love that piece that much, then I want it to come alive, and so I give it I give it away. So that's generally what happens. And uh, so my best pieces are are out dancing somewhere. Okay, I, um, I want to thank uh, Tanya and Peter for participating in the art panel today. And I'd like to invite you down to see their creations and the creations of all the amazing artists that we have downstairs, so thank you. <laughs>